All right, hello and welcome everyone to our uh, webinar today. This is another installment of the webinar series presented by Team Builder and Strength Performance Network. We're excited about our guest today. We have a very special guest, but we have to do some housekeeping before that and recognize uh, the people putting on this webinar. So first, I'd like to give a big shout out to Strength Performance Network, who is really the foundation for these webinars. They provide the technology, they provide the infrastructure for being able to do this and bringing these high quality speakers to your computer screen. Strength Performance Network is the first online social network dedicated exclusively to strength coaches. And you can find any, anything on there, including videos and photos from other strength coaches, job openings, tips, webinars like this, and educational content. So oftentimes it is a daily stop for strength coaches. And they also have a new, a new website called Strength Performance Daily, which is the highlighted content, the best of the best of Strength Performance Network. So be sure to check out Strength Performance Daily in addition to SPN. Also, Team Builder, uh, who I am with, this is Hewitt Tomlin, uh, is online strength and conditioning software, helping coaches program and streamline workouts for athletes. We work with over 600 organizations across high school, college, professional, and private practice strength coaches. Now we're going to get into the presentation. I'd like to introduce Jim Kilbasso. He's here with us today. Jim has a long uh, history and experience in the strength and conditioning world. If I were to highlight everything, we'd sit here forever and we'd never get to the presentation. So I'm, I'm going to give you the shorter version, which may not do it justice. But Jim is the director of and head of Total Performance Training Center. He trains athletes every day, but in addition to that, he wears many, many other hats. In addition to being a coach, he is a speaker, author of multiple books, and a consultant with a long, long list of clients that he's visited all the way from the most competitive professional sports leagues, such as the NFL and MLB, all the way down to high school programs and others. Uh, and Jim is also welcome to tell you more, and you can also research Jim online as he has a, an extensive online presence. Uh, but with that being said, we're going to move into just a few uh, housekeeping items before we actually get into the presentation. And we just want to make sure everyone knows that today's presentation is CSCCA CEU approved. And we, after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to a quiz. And successfully passing that quiz with a score of 100% will admit to you the CEUs. You can take the quiz as many times as you would like. So look out for that link, and we'll even post it in here, I believe, as well. Also, we are recording the webinar to YouTube immediately. That recording is yours. It's yours to share, and be sure to share it wide with all your peers. And then lastly, if you have any questions or concerns during the presentation, you're welcome to ask questions to Jim during. But even after, make sure to tweet us at Team Builder or tweet SP Network. And Jim also has a Twitter handle, which I'm sure he'll share with you after the presentation, and you can reach out directly to him on social media as well. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our presentation. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Jim Kilbasso. Coach, are you in Michigan right now? I am in Michigan, a beautiful uh, Detroit, or outside of Detroit right now. Nice. And Jim is, uh, has made a presentation for us that, uh, quite frankly, I'm really excited for. I just want to say before we start, our attendance for this webinar is the highest it's ever been. We have over 420 registrants for this webinar, which is a record for this webinar series. So Jim, thank you for that. And thank you everyone for being on board and uh, helping us make this, uh, this webinar series a success. We're really proud to do this and really grateful for the, uh, the kind of attention that it's got. So with no further ado, Jim, I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Hewitt, and thanks, Brian. This is awesome. There's so many people on here. This is a really cool way to share information and kind of get to know each other. And uh, the fact that you guys got this CEU approved is even even cooler. So um, I'm pretty excited to get going. So I, I don't want to mess around. If it's okay with you, Hewitt, I'm just going to uh, share my screen right now, and we'll jump into the webinar. Let's go ahead and do it. All right, are you able to see it right now? I'm gonna assume that you can see it right now um, because I think you muted yourself. Um, so- Yep, we can uh, see it, it's clear, it looks good. Okay, awesome. 
Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, we're going to talk about the science of acceleration, and this is something that I, um, I pretty much work on acceleration with athletes every day this time of year because it's NFL Combine prep season. And yeah, I've done a lot of research and, uh, and networking and, and talking to other coaches and figuring out the best ways to, to do this. But I kind of want to bring some of the science to you guys so you understand a little bit more about acceleration and at least the way that I think about acceleration. I am not going to sit here and tell you that I know absolutely everything and I know every single scientific study. Um, but I, I've looked into it for years and I've been doing this for many years and I'll kind of share some of the science that I use and what's behind the principles that, that I use uh, when I'm teaching acceleration. I, I really got kind of fascinated with, the, with acceleration back like in the 90s. I had already been very interested in um, speed training mechanics and speed development and agility development in general. But I was at a clinic where legendary strength coaches, uh, Boyd Epley and Mike Arthur were talking, the, the strength coaches from University of Nebraska. And at the time, Nebraska, if you guys remember back then, was um, kind of considered like the mecca of strength and conditioning and their football program was absolutely incredible back then. And um, they, they did a really cool study that I don't believe that it was ever actually published because it was kind of an internal study, but they shared it with us at this conference. And essentially what they did is they, they wanted to figure out what they tested, um, which testing um, drills or exercises and measurements were actually most highly correlated to on-field success. So they did something pretty unique, I thought. So they took all of the tests that they had, and they had um, they had dozens of different tests. So they had you know they had the forty and the ten and the bench press and vertical jump and broad jump and a million other things, um, and they had them all lined up. And then they also had um, they, they took the the team list to their coaches to the coaching staff. And they essentially had the coaching staff rate the players on um, their actual on-field playing ability, so their effectiveness on the field. And they now had two sets of data. And what they did is they, they did some statistical analysis to figure out which tests actually correlated to on-field success. And what they, what they presented to us was that the uh, ability to accelerate 10 yards and to do that over and over in a game um, was hands down had the highest correlation of any test to on-field playing ability. To me, that was, that was kind of, that was really cool to see. And it made total sense. And they showed a video um, of, a, of one of their players uh, just destroying people on the field and showed how great of a, of a 10 yard split he had. Um, and, and they talked about that for, for quite a while. At that point, I realized like, you know, it's probably not just football. It's probably a lot of field and court sports that, um, that the 10 yard, the ability to sprint and accelerate 10 yards was probably highly correlated to, to on field or on court success. So I decided that I really wanted to examine that. If you also, you know, if you've been around this field for a while, you probably remember back several years ago, Mike Boyle talking about um, how important it was to focus on the 10 yard dash when, and, and, the, and the start when you're working on combine prep, because that's where, that's where you're gonna see the biggest differences and the biggest improvements. Um, so, uh, so I really started looking into, you know, what we can do to, to work on acceleration and what goes into it. So this is kind of a simplified version of, um, of speed development or, or speed in general. Essentially, if you, uh, to, to run faster, you need to apply a big force into the ground in minimal amount of time or as fast as possible. And the force has to be applied in the right direction. And that's gonna equal running faster. Now, we're going to get into it in a second and realize that big force or, or improving your force production capabilities is going to come about through strength training. So getting stronger is part of the equation of running faster. Doing it in minimal time and applying that force in minimal time is the second part of the equation, and that's going to be done through explosive training methods. So you've got all sorts of different explosive training methods. You've got um, Olympic and explosive uh, lifts. You've got plyometrics, 
Um, this is also where things like weighted sleds come into play. Um, so the faster you can put that force into the ground, the better for running faster. And then you've got the right direction, which essentially means mechanics. The, the force has to be put into the ground in the right direction or have the right force orientation, as uh, we're now talking about, in order to run faster. Now, if you look down here at the bottom, you can see that there's other things that are involved. I'm not saying that these are the only things involved in running faster or getting better as an athlete. So you're going to have body composition that's going to be important. If you've got a bunch of fat mass on you, of course, that's going to slow you down. You need to have sports-specific conditioning and be good at sports specific movements it's no good to be um, to be able to just run one time in a in a straight line and not be able to um, be good at your sport so you have other things in, involved you have the concept of muscular stiffness um, which is the ability to kind of rebound and be bouncy if you will and then there's flexibility and mobility issues and I you know there's there's probably many other factors that go into it but um, you know in general if you think about speed development as uh, as big force plus minimal time plus right direction equals run faster, you're probably going to be heading in the right direction. Now, everybody's seen this slide probably before or maybe a version of it. It's essentially a force velocity uh, curve overlaid with a power, a peak power curve. So the straight line or the, the, uh, the, the non-dotted line is the force velocity curve. And essentially, everybody on here probably is well aware that the faster you move, the, the less force that's applied. And the more force you apply to the ground or to a bar or to whatever you're applying it to, the slower the speed is gonna be. Now, what I think is cool is that um, overlaid on this is the, is the power curve, and that's gonna be the dotted line that we're looking at. And there's a lot of research out trying to determine um, the, the, the right way to develop peak power and to actually demonstrate peak power. And similar to the force velocity curve, if you look on the far left, um, the faster you, or the, the lighter the weight that you use relative to your own strength or an athlete's um, one rep max, max capabilities. So the lighter the weight, the faster that, that athlete's gonna be able to move whatever it is and it starts going up and up and up and creates more and more power so somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of an athlete's one rep max when they are trying to move that weight quickly that's going to be where peak power output is at its highest um, I know that that's a huge range. So, you know, you may be sitting here thinking like, okay, should I use 30% or 70%? Um, if you look at this, and this is kind of a synopsis of the research, there's a wide range in there. Now, we've done some of our own research. Um, I did a couple of years ago uh, when we were, we were doing combine prep at the University of Michigan, and they had the, they had the Kaiser um, squat or jump squat machines. And if you've ever used one of those or seen it, essentially what it does is it's, you know, like you're standing underneath it and you're, you're squatting up or kind of like, it's almost like you're jumping and there's resistance applied and pads at your shoulder. The, the harder you put up, it actually has a readout of peak power. Um, measured in watts. So we had we had guys that had whatever the weight was on there and and they came up as fast as they could and it spit out whatever the watts were. And then we decided to increase the weight a little bit and they came up as fast as they could again and all of a sudden the, the power output went up. And then we added more weight and it went up and we added more weight and it kept going up and up and up. But we hit that sweet spot somewhere in there, and I don't know exactly what it was, but it was somewhere between 30 and 70%. And I knew that we had gone too far when we added just a little bit more resistance and the kids would, would drive it up, and all of a sudden, they couldn't get the, the same number. The, the wattage output was lower. And if we added more weight, it started going down and down and down. Um, the weight was higher and they were still trying as hard as they could, but they weren't able to achieve the same level of peak power. Now, what's, what's kind of cool about this though, is if you are a strength coach or a speed coach or performance coach, um, you need to understand that there are different 
Um, there are different measures of power. So you've got down on the left side, you've got more of your speed. So when you're using relatively light weights, that's more focus on speed. You get a little bit heavier. Um, and now you're talking about speed strength. Now you get into the 30 to 70% range and you're talking about power development. Um, and then you know, you go on down the right and you get into the strength speed and then finally um, max strength. But you have to understand that working for max strength is very different than working on power and working on power is very different than working on speed. And if you are going to put together a complete program for an athlete, it's probably a good idea to include um, all three of these things. And I know it says five on here, but it, at least you get the speed, the power and the max strength. And uh, hopefully this kind of gives you a, an overview uh, and a slight understanding of uh, the different things you have to do. And, you know, I, I'm going to look at this as if you if you remember back to that last slide, um, if you go down to the max strength part, the 85 percent or greater, that's going to be your your big force in the equation. The 30 to 70 percent, um, the power range there, that's going to be your as fast as possible part of the equation. And then the speed stuff is going to be probably working on mechanics or doing some sled work where we'll actually talk about that here later. All right. Now, what, what's difficult and where the art of strength and conditioning and, and performance enhancement comes in is that there's a delicate um, balance that you have to, you know, you have to kind of play with between overload and specificity. The bottom line in strength and conditioning is that we are trying to overload an athlete and overload different movements to create some sort of a training stimulus, which is then gonna have a training effect. So overload is kind of like the, the foundation of everything that we do. But specificity is very different. Specificity essentially states that if you wanna get better at something, you have to just practice that. Now, as you overload that, whatever that is, let's call it running mechanics, as you overload running, the mechanics change. So the more you overload something, the less specific it is. And the more specific it is, the less the, there is overload. So if you are thinking about running and acceleration, the most specific way to train that would be simply to, um, to, to run fast or to accelerate with no load. If you wanted to start overloading that, now you're talking about adding resistance to your acceleration. So you're talking about sleds, maybe using a, a Woodway Force treadmill um, or some variation of it. So kind of like I said in the last slide, this slide kind of represents the different factors that are in that, that speed training equation. So um, like I mentioned, if you're going to increase force, you're going to do that through strength training. If you want to increase the power part of that equation, you're going to do that through explosive work and plyometrics. The speed strength that I mentioned is going to be weighted movements. And so in this case, you're talking about sleds. But then this last part is what I start really finding fascinating. It's the force orientation. So the direction that that force is applied. And that is essentially your mechanics or your running technique. And this is possibly the most important yet most often ignored trainable attribute. And let's look at some of the science behind that. So back in uh, back in you know in the 90s, people were trying to figure out what the biggest determinants of speed were, and they were looking at all sorts of different things, thinking that um, that the, that fast runners must have quicker legs and they must have stronger hip flexors or stronger hip extensors or um, apply more force. They were, they, were, they were looking at all sorts of different things and trying to figure out what made people run fast. Well, in 2011, um, you can see this, this study by J.B. J. B. Moore and, and et al. Um, it definitively showed that force application technique so that's, run, that's running mechanics, basically, and the orientation of the force. So that is like how the force is applied, the direction that the force is applied into the ground were more important than the total amount of force applied. So they were using force plates and they found that the direction uh, that the force is applied and the direction in which the force is applied is much more important to speed than the total amount of force. They found that horizontal force application was found to be correlated to sprinting speed, but vertical force and the total amount of force were not. 
So what they started kind of parsing out is that yeah, it's great to be able to put a lot of force into the ground, and that is still part of the equation, but vertical force and the total amount of force were not correlated to sprinting speed. Now, for us as strength coaches, um, that kind of sucks because everything we do is, is in the weight room and most of our uh, explosive kind of efforts are generally vertical force production type of, type of movements. So I'm talking about like every Olympic lift and most plyometrics and jumping and um, a lot of medicine ball work that's, uh, you know, that's mainly geared up and down squatting, lunging, every, pretty much everything because of how gravity is applied and we need to work against gravity. Everything is, is vertically based. So yes, we are in the weight room developing speed in the sense that it is working on that first part of the equation possibly the second part of the equation but what this study in 2011 showed is that that those things were not as big of a deal as the horizontal force application and the force orientation so that kind of changed a lot for people and then peter weigh in 2014 so this is a much more recent study followed up and he was looking at elite sprinters compared to normal people and what he found basically backed this up and just provided more evidence. And he again was using force platforms. And I believe he had a, uh, had a lot of force platforms and maybe even one that he had worked into and in, embedded into a high speed treadmill to look at things. I'm not, I, I can't remember the specifics on it, but he found that elite sprinters actually run differently and have different force orientation than other runners. Now, what again, different force orientation than other runners means is they have different mechanics. They are applying the force that they have into the ground in a different direction than the rest of us do. So they have different mechanics. So, I mean, it was pretty obvious in his conclusions. He found that ground contact time, leg speed, ground reaction forces, Pretty much all the things that we thought were going to be the big contributors to speed back like in the 90s, um, they were a little bit greater. They were 30% greater than, than regular people, but it didn't account for the 80% greater speed that they actually ran. So what this says is that, yeah, these elite sprinters are able to put force into the ground a little bit quicker, but only 30% greater compared to actually running 80% faster than the rest of us. So what these two studies essentially showed is that in order to run faster, you have to put the force into the ground in the right direction. That is what is the key to running faster. Now, in order to create horizontal power, um, which is essentially what we're trying to do, you have to look at essentially what great sprinters are doing. Now I am in no way trying to turn everybody that I train into a track runner. So, and I know that a lot of you are not working only uh, with track athletes. So this is not saying that, you know, we all need to be able to mimic Usain Bolt or Asafa Powell or any of these guys. Um, what I'm saying is if we're going to figure out how to accelerate faster, we might as well look at physics and look at the fastest accelerators in the world to see what they're doing differently. Because the, the last studies that I just showed pretty much showed definitively that these guys run differently than slower runners. So if we wanna run faster, well, let's figure out what they're doing. So the first thing on here is that great sprinters cover one and a half meters on the very first step. Now, when you look at most people that, that you and I are probably training, when they take that first step, and I'll show you a couple of videos of what it probably looks like, when they take that first step, most athletes, even pretty good athletes, aren't covering anywhere near to one and a half meters. That is a huge distance, and that's one and a half meters starting line. So these sprinters actually have their hands down and their feet are um, a, a couple feet behind them and they're still able to get out and their first contact with that first step is made one and a half meters away from the starting line. 
That's crazy. If you ever get a chance to check out a, a short YouTube video, um, type in Usain Bolt slow-mo and a video comes up that actually shows um, the beginning as a Safa Powell doing a, um, a sprint start out of the blocks and it's in slow motion and it's pretty crazy. And it, it's a great idea to show to athletes that you're trying to get to, to increase that first step. So that first step, um, actually takes much longer than other steps. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. The foot height is only 12 to 30 centimeters on the first step. So it's not, they're not getting into a cyclical action of their legs on the first couple of steps. It's more of a piston type action that goes on and they're pushing backwards into the ground rather than cycling like at top speed. For me, that's really important and it's important for me to teach athletes that there are different phases of running and that they have to understand the differences. A lot of athletes learn, maybe they learn top end mechanics and they think they're always supposed to run like that. So they come right out of the start and they're cycling their legs and they're up tall and they're basically not pushing and they're not, they're not accelerating as fast as they can. You've got other athletes who maybe were taught how to accelerate, but don't realize that they need to also have different mechanics at top end. And then you've got other athletes who they know how to run fast, but they don't know when to use it. So when you're teaching athletes how to accelerate in, in this way, in this manner, it's important to explain to them when they're going to use this. So for example, in football, you're not going to, you know, a, a running back isn't going to have you know, uh, start out the play just taking off running as fast as he or she can. A, a football player, a running back, is going to get the ball, find the hole, get through it, and then he's probably going to accelerate through it. In basketball, you're not accelerating as fast as you possibly can in a half-court set most of the time. Um, you're going to accelerate when your team gets the rebound and you have to get um, down the court as fast as you can. In lacrosse, when you are you know, running plays, you're probably not accelerating maximally when, you, um, you know, when you're passing the ball around. But when it's time to go, then it's time to go. And you need to teach athletes when it's time to go, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to try to cover more ground um, like we just showed. You're going to take those big, powerful steps. And if you look on here, the ground contact time is 0.17 seconds on the first step compared to 0.8 second, 0 0.08 seconds at max velocity. So it's that first step is on the ground twice as long as the other steps up at top speed. Now the very first push off is even longer. It's about four times as long. What this tells us is that, um, that in order to push hard and accelerate, it's gonna take a little bit longer. And if you think about physics, um, this statement is based, it's a, it's a physics, uh, basic truism is that a longer impulse overcomes inertia faster than a shorter impulse. And I hate to go all sciencey on this, but let's think about it. A longer impulse overcomes inertia faster than a shorter impulse. What that essentially means is an, an impulse is, um, is force applied into the ground in a specific direction. The longer that force is applied, the easier it is to overcome inertia. And inertia is simply just what holds us in place. And another way for, for stating overcoming inertia is acceleration. So a longer impulse or longer steps pushing heart longer into the ground will increase acceleration faster than shorter impulses. So when you're teaching athletes to accelerate maximally, and instead of taking a bunch of teeny little baby steps um, where they're not getting anywhere, your athletes should be trying to cover ground and their turnover is gonna be significantly slower on those first couple of steps. Think about trying to push a car. You don't get behind a car and take a bunch of teeny little baby steps. You get behind a car and the first step is much longer. And then as the car gets moving, your turnover starts to, to increase. It's the same idea when you're trying to accelerate maximally. All right, so things to look for. Well, we kind of already covered them. Um, 
this picture essentially is what I call a power position. And this is what I stop videos on all the time to, to let athletes see where they are. What we're looking for here is a really steep forward lean. He's on about a 45 degree angle. You can only lean so far before you're, you're going to fall, but you want to maximize the forward lean because the, the more you're leaning forward from your foot, it, the more horizontal force there's going to be and the more upright you are the more vertical force you're going to have we already learned from the science that we're trying to increase horizontal force not vertical force so the forward lean has to come all the way from the foot you shouldn't be bent over at the hips and this is a great example of pretty much a straight line from the heel all the way up to the shoulders the knee drive is going to be super exaggerated compared to the rest of the uh, run, or at least at top end speed. Um, if you look at the angle of the hip in relationship to the rest of the body, that's at greater than 90 degrees. Most people just feel weird getting it up that high. You're also going to look for positive shin angles. If you look at this athlete's um, front shin, you can see that it's essentially, it has a positive shin angle. If he drives his foot down right now, his foot is going to go kind of backwards and hit the ground almost backwards. That's going to be a positive shin angle, which is going to help him create more horizontal force. Um, I kind of mentioned that braking versus propulsion in the sense that every step that you take is going to have both horizontal and vertical forces. And every step that you take is first going to have some braking effect when it hits the ground. And then it's going to have a propulsive effect. Um, when you are accelerating, there should be no braking going on whatsoever. And the way to eliminate that is to have the feet driving essentially backwards, not out in front of you. The farther in front of you, every single centimeter that the foot lands in front of an athlete, the more braking effect goes on and the less propulsion because you're increasing the vertical forces that go on the ground. Ankle dorsiflexion, I don't really use the term with athletes. I usually say knees up, toes up, but we all know it as ankle dorsiflexion is important because if you look at this picture right now, if his toe is pointed, his toe would be almost on the ground. And what we're trying to do is increase the distance that he's able to travel on every single step. If his foot is closer to the ground, then that foot's going to hit the ground earlier and he's going to stop traveling forward. It's also going to create a lot of braking force because now he's going to have to decelerate that ankle. And what I just said was we're trying to cover ground on those first few steps. Looks like he's going to cover um, a little bit less than a yard on this first step. And he ran a really fast 40 time compared to uh, these elite sprinters that are covering a meter and a half. So a meter and a half is almost the end of this screen, which is pretty crazy amount of, amount of space. All right. So let's look at some of this in, in real life so you can see what I'm looking at. And I apologize that this isn't the most clear um, image uh, in their video quality in the world, but it'll, it'll give us an idea. So all these things that we were just talking about, we're looking for this power position right there. And the, you know, video technology, I'm doing this on coach's eye. It really helps break this down. He's got a great angle. He's got his knee up high, just like the last picture. He's got a positive shin angle, and he's going to try to cover some ground by jumping in the air. When that front foot hits the ground, you can see he's got a great positive shin angle. That means that he is going to be creating more horizontal force. His foot should be hitting back behind his center mass, which it did. On the second step, he's also going to get his knees up really high and try to cover as much ground as possible. That foot's got to hit backwards, so at backwards and hopefully under or behind by the time it actually um, pushes into the ground behind his center of mass, which is going to then help him propel himself forward. And as he gets going, there should be a huge split between the knees. So the, the thighs should be split apart because that's going to help cover help him cover more ground. You can see even on his fourth step, he's able to get um, a good positive shin angle. His knee was up very high and he was creating a lot of, a lot of space between his knees. And he's still striking the ground essentially under or behind his center of mass. All right, so this is, a, this is an example of a fast athlete. So this, this guy ran, a, I believe it was a 4-4 at the NFL Combine. Um, now let's look at somebody who does not run like this anymore, but this is what he ran like when he came in. Um, this is what you'll see more often than not with people who are untrained and haven't learned how to accelerate. 
So let's watch what he does now compared to the, what we just saw and to what we've been talking about. So he understands that he's got to lean forward. He also understands that he's got to create a positive shin angle. But if you look at how far he travels and his angle, it's all off. So instead of pushing his hips through, um, you can see that he's got a rounded back. His head is up. He doesn't get full extension. His knee is not up nearly high enough. It should be up like, like much higher, but he does have a good shin angle. All right, that's where his knee should be. And you can see that in the last couple uh, slides in the, in the video. Now, where his foot hits the ground, he covered like maybe six inches. He does have a positive shin angle, but he didn't go anywhere. So these are the dinky little steps that I'm talking about that we're trying to avoid. So he didn't really get anywhere on that first step. He didn't utilize any of the power that he has. His second step, he's leaning over too far and he's bent forward with his head up and his knee, so his left knee in this case, in relationship to the rest of his body is not nearly high enough. And if you look at the thigh split, it's, he's barely getting, his, barely getting his knee up. He's not opening up at all. That's where his knee should be. It should be much higher. Um, now, as he continues, he still isn't taking big enough steps. He's, and he's not allowing himself to float in the air or cover any ground. So this is now his third step. And by his third step and even into his fourth step, he's really only getting to where uh, an elite athlete would be getting at about their second step. So it's not nearly far enough. Now, this was, we were able to correct this very easily. And it's, a, um, if I could show you what he looks like now, you'd see that, oh, this is a great example of what a big difference you can make. And he went from running times of like four eights and four nines to running four fives. It's a huge difference and it's mainly due to his acceleration mechanics. All right, so hopefully that's just a little bit of a look at what I see when I'm training an athlete so that you can also see that as well. All right, let's move on to weighted sleds because there's a ton of research on this. And this is one of the things that you're probably going to want to utilize when you are training for acceleration, to, to improve acceleration. There's a couple of different ways that have been found to best utilize a weighted sled. That's gonna be either with a relatively light weight, which is gonna be about 15 to 20% of body weight, and all sorts of studies have, have shown that a light weight between about 15 to 20% of body weight, it, they've, all, they've all confirmed that yes, this will improve acceleration speed. Most of the studies are, uh, are fairly long. They're using, um, you know, they're going to be going for somewhere between six and 10 weeks, and they're usually training twice a week. What's hard to do is to parse out, like, was it only the weighted sleds that increased this? Um, because research has to control for all the variables. So you have to try to keep everything else consistent. Um, but, the, but the research has shown pretty definitively that these lighter sleds do increase acceleration speed. Now, more recently, um, Kawamori et al. did a study where they increased the, um, the weight that was on the sled to about 45 to 50% of their body weight. And they showed that, uh, like I talked about before, it changed running mechanics. So the overload changed running mechanics, whereas the 15 to 20% of body weight did not change running mechanics nearly as much. There was less than a 10% decrease in the actual sprint speed. With the 45 to 50% of body weight, there's a much bigger decrease in the sprint speed and mechanics change. But what it did is it, sh it, it showed that, that using this much weight actually teaches in, um, athletes to improve their hor horizontal force production strategies. So essentially, they learn to lean farther and to drive backwards harder, creating more, more horizontal force than vertical force. Because with that much weight pulling behind you, you really can't hit the ground vertically because you're not going to go anywhere. So this is a great thing to try with teams where you're not able to sit down and show every athlete videos of what he or she is doing. Um, this pretty much just teaches athletes to get that forward lean and to create horizontal force. 
Now, just recently, I think it came out in November, J.B. Morin, who is one of the guys who did the, uh, one of the other articles that I referenced earlier, he actually put on 80% of body weight. And interestingly, he found about the same results that the 45 to 50% of body weight showed. It totally messes up running mechanics, so things change dramatically, but it did work. Um, they, they were actually able to show improvements in, uh, in the ability to accelerate. Um, I don't think enough research has been done on weights this heavy, and his conclusion even stated that um, that he thinks that this that a lot further research, a lot more further research needs to be done in this area. But it does show some promise that using heavier weights um, will improve sprint speed. Now. For my money, I'm going to use a combination of all these because we already talked about, you know, at the beginning, the, um, the equation for running faster, and we showed that force velocity curve and where the power is developed. If we can use different, um, if we can hit different parts of that power curve, I think that we're probably going to have a more complete program. So while these studies are showing that increasing sprint speed can be done just with weighted sleds, now that is going to be improving one aspect of the equation. Now let's think if we could actually work on mechanics while we're using the, the weighted sleds and we could be doing strength training to increase force production capabilities, you know, concurrently or while we're doing uh, this kind of program, that's probably where, where we're going to see the best results. It's going to be a multiple methods approach. You're not going to use just weightlifting to, to, to run faster. You're not going to use just sleds to run faster and you're not going to only work on mechanics um, you're going to try to balance the overload and the specificity by using everything you have now all of these things are showing that short distances is where you're going to see the benefits so you're not trying to run a whole 40 these are going to be usually less than 20 yards so you're going to want to pick short distances 10 15 maybe 20 yards you're going to want to have full recovery in between every single sprint. Before you get into a weighted sled, you're gonna to wanna to address acceleration mechanics at least a little bit so athletes know what they're supposed to try to do. Um, and then uh, you're going to do this multiple times a week. It's, all the studies show that, that twice a week seems to be kind of that sweet spot. All right, so, what I tried to do there is give you an overview of some of the science and also how to use the science in a little bit more of a practical way. Um, a lot of this is covered. This is by no means supposed to be a commercial for anything. This is just information for you, but um, you can see that uh, my, my new email address is jim at iyca.org, and you can go to iyca.org. I recently took over the International Youth Conditioning Association, and the speed certification that we have breaks a lot of this down into more practical terms, and it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's, a, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing material that Dr. Toby Brooks and I um, wrote for you guys. Um, but you can also contact me on social media. You can see, uh, like Hewitt mentioned, my Twitter handle is at Jim Cabasso. You can also look up, um, you know, me on, look me up on Facebook and Instagram, um, Google me, whatever you want to do. Uh, there's only a couple of Jim Kilbasos, and my dad does not do speed and agility training. And um, if you type in Kilbasso, um, probably the only other thing that's going to come up is maybe you're going to get into some sausage, sausage stuff, but that's, that's kielbasa with an A. So hopefully you'll be able to find me and I hope this really helped. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so Hewitt and I can talk and, um, and let's see if there are some, uh, there are some questions because I know that there's a lot of people on here. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, well we have a question. question. Oh my gosh, there's a ton of questions, huh? Yeah. And uh, I was just kind of browsing through. We have some really good questions here from people in the audience. So, uh, we have about 15 minutes left, and you know that's a, a soft limit. So, Jim, with about a dozen questions, if, and maybe you could answer each one in like a 30-second to one-minute answer. If someone okay. is looking for a more in-depth question, uh, well, feel free to email Jim, as you just saw, and uh, get the conversation going on Twitter. A lot of people so far have been tweeting about this webinar, which is cool. Awesome. So there's no reason why why not to, to open it up online. So uh, feel free to do that if we don't get around to you. But let's go ahead and start from the top. Um, Bill Jones is asking, did the Morin study look at top speed or some form of acceleration? 
Um, that's a great question. And off the top of my head, who asked that? Bill did? I can't uh -huh. remember. Um, I think that they may have been, I think the force plates may have been um, out a ways and I don't think it was, um, I don't think it was acceleration. So I have kind of extrapolated what they found to acceleration because I think it's pretty much the same idea. Right. Um, but I think uh, whoever asked that question, I'm pretty sure that it was at top speed. Gotcha. Um, all right. So Tristan asks, um, is there a best drill or exercise to enhance that first step in the acceleration process? Um, that's a great question. And for my money, it's practicing. It's you got to practice the technique and the mechanics. Um, I use something that I made up called a, a foot popper, which I think that I've got some YouTube videos uh, showing foot poppers, um, and I know it's in our it's I know it's in our uh, our speed and certification and all the speed materials that we have through the IYCA. But basically, it's it's um, it's essentially leaning forward and lifting up one knee and driving your foot down into the ground backwards. What I've found is that a lot of athletes don't know the direction that they're supposed to hit the ground with, with that first step. So a lot of athletes will actually reach out in front of them. And, and, and then once they get the direction, they also forget to push off with their front foot. So they don't go anywhere. So they should kind of feel like they're almost like jumping in the air. They're moving in the air. And then right at the peak of it, you know, before they slow down, that's when they're supposed to hit the ground backwards. Most people don't have that. So um, the exercise that I would do, it would be working on exactly that, like kind of, you know, launching themselves out and, and learning how to hit the ground backwards. So that being said, of the three components you mentioned earlier, force, time, and direction, for the first step, direction is most important to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, force is huge. Um, right. You know, you, a, a weak athlete's not going to be able to get out, and and strength is also highly correlated to speed. So don't get me wrong; the, all three of those things are very highly correlated to speed. So getting stronger is going to help. But if you could be as strong as you want, and if you're hitting the ground out in front of you, you're you're still putting the brakes on. Yeah. So you know, it doesn't matter doesn't matter how much force you put in the ground. Those studies showed that it's the direction that the force goes into the ground that it, that's what takes advantage of the strength training capability. So, to me, you know, if you're going to spend all that time in the weight room getting stronger, you might as well be delivering it into the ground in at least close to the right direction, rather than essentially fighting yourself by putting it in the ground in the wrong way. Cool. This next question is a little bit longer. From the National Association of Speed and Explosion, it talks about applying horizontal force in order to reach peak speed, and then a more vertical posture and force application for maintaining that speed. Based on the 2011 study that you showed us today with vertical force application to be irrelevant, what are your thoughts on maintaining speed after acceleration? Yeah, so um, I don't think that that contradicts it at all. You're going to have a more horizontal uh, posture but if you look at elite sprinters when their foot hits the ground they're actually hitting the ground backwards like they're they're pulling their foot backwards and applying force horizontally and um they're not they're not uh, hitting the ground straight down and, and creating vertical forces they're creating those the uh um the horizontal forces the posture allows them to float in the air longer and to then to get their knee up in a good position to float in the air and then have enough time to pull that foot backwards so if you really watch somebody run fast they they are upright but they're not striking the ground vertically gotcha Matt Grimm is a collegiate strength coach. He says, Jim, if you're constantly pressed for time, like myself, what do you believe is the more important quality to train if you had to choose, production of force or force application? Well, I don't, I don't think that we should pick one or the other. Um, you know, if you're pressed for time, I totally understand that as a as a former college strength coach, I get it. You know, you don't have much time with them. So what I would recommend is you you basically insert um, insert some acceleration drills or at least acceleration work right into your warm up or right into part of your workout. So for example, you may spend a couple minutes doing a warm up at the beginning uh, of your workout a couple days a week. Um, if you really are serious about increasing the speed, 
uh, of these athletes, then let them then teach them acceleration mechanics. You got to teach them first, otherwise they don't know what to do. Teach them the mechanics and then let them practice it a few times at the beginning of, uh, of each workout. It doesn't, you don't have to do it, you know, all the time, but, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, that that's like saying we have to do only one thing. So, you know, so, you know, when, when I, when I get questions, like people say, well, what's the best exercise for, you know, you know, would you rather do squats or, uh, or cleans? Well, why do we have to pick one? You just have to figure out, you know, our jobs are difficult. We don't have much time. We have to figure out how to, how to incorporate them. Yep. Uh, Michael Dutcher asks, after how many steps should the technique change from being a piston-like action to becoming a cycling motion? That's a great question. That's going to depend on the athlete. Usually um, somewhere between four and eight steps is when it, it starts getting more, uh, turning more into a cyclical action. The stronger and better the sprinter is, the longer they're able to have more of a piston type action. Um, so you know, what an Olympic athlete is going to do is going to be different than what most of the rest of us are going to be able to do. If, it, if you're working with a particularly weak athlete, um, they may only be able to get two pushes and then they start to come to come upright. Um, and when I say weak, it's weak relative to, uh, to the athlete's body weight. So you might have a, a giant lineman, for example, that, you know, maybe he squats a lot, but compared to his body weight, it's not that much. He's probably not going to be able to maintain that forward lean and, and piston type action very long. Cool. Uh, this was asked around the time where you're showing some video and uh, Laulu Fashina asks, what are the priority cues or methods that you would use to correct the error specific to hunching over and short steps in the first error model? Oh my gosh. Um, Okay, so that's going to be highly individualized depending on what the error is. The hunching over, um, one of the best things to do is video, is to show athletes video, especially in today's day and age. Kids, kids get so much more out of seeing themselves and seeing a video than you just trying to explain things to them. So um, I, I'm not paid by Coach's Eye by any means, but Coach's Eye is a super – inexpensive app that you can get on your phone and that's kind of what I, that's what i was using in those videos you can sit there and, and videotape somebody um have them come over watch what they're doing see it and now you can say okay here's what i want you to do um some athletes will or some coaches will talk about doing a jumping drill like onto a crash mat so that's something that you can do but i i think I don't think you have to necessarily go into that you can you can use video and, and explain what you want them to do that way Cool. And for what it's worth, I drive a Prius and I love it and they don't pay me to say that. So <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so Mike Misson asks if horizontal force is most important for acceleration and vertical force does not seem to correlate relating to that study. Would you squat an elite sprinter during a peaking phase? Why or why not? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think you, you're, you're still going to, it's like anything, you're going to maintain whatever strength that that athlete has. But if you're, if you're training an elite sprinter, um, which I will preface by saying that is not what I do. I do more field and court sports and combine prep. So it's a little different, but you know, if I'm, if I'm training an athlete for the NFL combine or pro day during their peaking phase, you know, which in, in that sense, it's a very short phase. Yeah, we, we will still squat, but I'm not at that point trying to develop strength. I'm probably trying to maintain the strength so that they can get through that peaking phase without, without dropping um, any force production capabilities. But at that point, you know, for most athletes, if you're talking about an elite sprinter, by the time they reach a peaking phase, they're not going to probably get much stronger um, at that at that point because they've probably been squatting for a couple of years and we all know it's hard to to get to increase numbers in the squat if you're already pretty strong so sure. there's a certain point that i would probably move away from trying to improve an athlete's squat numbers and and go more towards power production and so you'd be more looking at how fast they can move that weight rather than how much they can they can actually lift because the more they lift 
Um, it also takes away from their ability to recover. And it also starts to, you know, you, you start to run, run into risks, you know, at, at a certain point, why put, um, on an elite athlete's back when you know competition is coming around the corner. Um, you, you know, you, you're probably going to have different priorities. Yeah. We've got about eight questions left and not a lot of time. So this is going to be like the speed round in Jeopardy. Okay. All right. right. We're going to try to get through it. I just want to get people's questions. This is from Dan Farthing. Dan's a team builder customer from Saskatchewan, Canada. Dan asks, with sled drag training, are you aware of any studies that looked at the impact of waist belts versus torso harnesses? What's your opinion? Wow, that's a great question, and I don't think there's been anything definitive. I prefer the shoulder harness, but the shoulder harness is much harder to use with the heavy weight. I see. If you're, this is from Sam Whitney at Temple University, also a team builder. If you are going to use a variety of sled weighted sleds uh, or or weighted sleds, how would you program or periodize it? Um, here's what I do. I do four sprints with a light. Uh, so after we warm up and work on mechanics for a couple minutes, I do four sprints with the lightweight, two without anything. So contrast it so they're able to do it with nothing. And then we'll do four to six with the heavyweight, contrast it with two of nothing, and then we move on. Great. Peter Rems asks, uh, do you think acceleration will help an athlete with change of direction work? Um, it will help an athlete get in and out of their cuts faster because they'll be able to accelerate into a cut and then out of a cut. Um, so it will, it will help dramatically in that regard, but it doesn't necessarily help the actual change of direction. You have to work on that specifically. Um, but I do think that if you're going to work on change of direction, teach athletes how to accelerate out of the cut because a lot of times um, in agility drills, they'll just make the cut and then kind of stop. So yeah, I do think it would kind of help in that regard. Cool. Shauna Forsyth asks, what factors would determine the average number of steps an athlete takes during the takeoff? Average number of steps. So um, fast athletes will generally be able to cover 10 yards in six steps. Um, and almost every time that, uh, that we've done testing on it, the fewer the number of steps um, over 10 yards, the faster the time. I don't, does that, I hope, I don't know if that answers the question or not. She can ask on Twitter later as well. Um, Matt Warner asks, aside from technique, what are some things that you found to specifically train that first step push off? Matt says, I'm in a weight room. I don't get to see the field that often. So what are some weight room specific things he can do to help first step push off? Um, if you have, you know, if you can do sleds, that would help. Um, if you can do uh, like split squat jumps, and one leg squats um, kind of explosively, uh, that, would, that, would, that would help. But I think ultimately you're going to eventually have to work on the technique. Gotcha. Uh, Randy White, I'm interested in this one because I see this one all over Instagram. What is your opinion on wall drills as used by coaches as a tool to show proper angles and knee drive? Is there a better coaching tool for the same effect? Um, I use wall drills uh, pretty much with everybody that I teach, but every time I go to a conference and show how I use the wall drill, it seems like people think like, oh, well, that's an interesting way of using them. Um, I don't know if I have a video out on that. I do know that it is part of our, our speed certification through the IYCA. Um, and if you're going to the CSCCA conference um, this year, I'm going to be speaking there and kind of talking more about that. So, or we can kind of continue the conversation, but a wall drill is, drill is great if used properly. A wall drill sucks if it's not used properly. Yeah. All right. Last question here. This comes from Christian Sears. Um, he's at Landon here in my area in DC. Christian says, with respect to upper body and arm drive, were any of the studies looking at a correlation between horizontal upper body lifts, presses and pulls? Not that I know. I've never seen one. Um, I did not address upper body uh, mechanics and, and arm swing mechanics in this specifically because um, arm swing is much easier to, to change um, and to correct than lower body mechanics. And um, I, I usually wait and address the arm swing after I address the lower body. But arm swing is is, is definitely important. It's yes. Don't, don't, don't take my cutting that out of this as it's not important. It's very important, but I mean, I only had so much time. So hopefully people don't think that what I just said is the only thing that I do. I mean, there's a lot more to it. But, uh, 
Yeah, exactly. We only have an hour. Yeah, you got to address it. But I don't think that there are any studies because you're not, it, it, the arm swing is more for your ability to maintain spinal position and hip position. Um, so, you know, when you rip one arm back, you're, it, it, it keeps you from rotating. And when you rotate is where you're gonna lose the force. So I don't think that being stronger at the arm swing would necessarily, this is just, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing. I don't think it would make you a faster runner. It's more about balance so that it uh, allows your spine and hips to be in a position to put more power into the ground. That's interesting. Hey, perhaps we'll have an advanced webinar and we'll talk upper body. You know, we're gonna get really into the weeds there, maybe. <laughs> If people are lucky. Um, well, good. Got, we're going to conclude it there. We got through a lot of questions. Uh, so thank you, Jim, for sticking it out and, and moving fast. I know you could probably go on much longer and expand on these on these answers, but thank you for, for being brief with us here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and switch it back here and just, again, remind people of things before we leave. If you would like your CSCCA credit, um, make sure to look out for the link. It's going to be sent in an email to you. Um, so be aware of that, please. Also, the recording will go out on YouTube very, very soon. We'll tweet it out. We'll blast it out. Uh, again, share it with someone. Share it with someone that you know who could use some of the tips talked about today. Uh, even some of the questions at the end talking about how to implement this stuff in a real-life setting uh, in different settings that you coach in. And then lastly, uh, interact on Twitter if you have more questions or, or want to get in contact with Jim. Jim showed his contact information earlier in the presentation. You can see that in the recording. So thank you once again for everyone. Uh, we'll be back soon with another webinar. But uh, finally, Jim, thank you so much for your time, your knowledge, your experience. We want to thank you, and we're very grateful. Hey, thanks a lot, Hewitt and Brian. This was awesome. Hopefully, people got something out of it. And feel free to get back in touch with me. I'll, I'll try to respond as quickly as I can. But that that was awesome. And uh, it's just really cool to see all these questions come down in the chat the chat line and to see how many people stick, stuck around for the entire webinar. So thanks so much. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you soon. See you, guys.